This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every two weeks. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. Hello, everybody. Markus here. Before we get started with today's episode or actual content, I would like to uh, pass a quick message on to you. Um, you might want to call it advertisement. <laughs> At Itemis in Stuttgart, we are looking for new colleagues. Uh, we are a consulting company that focuses on model-driven development, DSLs, product line engineering, systems engineering, mostly in embedded systems, but also other systems. And we want to grow. And we really have, uh, it's a challenge for us to find qualified people, um, especially, obviously, people who have some background in this whole model-driven world, maybe a couple of years of, um, you know, actual on-the-job experience. So if you want to work these technologies and if you want to live or if you do live or want to live in southern Germany, Stuttgart area, capital of Baden-Württemberg, you know, the place where everybody fights over Stuttgart 21, the new train station, um, Send me a message at uh, felder.acm.org. Um, yeah, let me know. We'd be happy to talk to you. Okay, that's that's it. Short and sweet. Now let's get on with the actual content. This is Robert Blumen. I'm at the Oracle Java One conference in San Francisco with Nati Shalom. Nati is the CTO and founder of Gigaspaces and one of the leading bloggers and industry thinkers in the area of distributed systems. Nadi, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you very much, Robert. Please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, so first of all, I'm the CTO and founder, as you rightly said, of uh, Gigaspaces. And uh, I've been dealing with distributed computing in the past 10 years since we uh, started Gigaspaces. And before that, I was uh, mainly an expert in other type of distributed computing, where uh, specifically Corba and J2E and Genie, uh, all those type of uh, things. And I'm a technologist. I love technology. I love software. And I basically love what I'm doing. So, Nadi, we're going to be talking about in-memory data grid architectures today. I'm going to start by talking about a paper from Professor John Oosterhout of Stanford University. I know that you're familiar with this paper. How would you summarize Oosterhout's thesis in this article? I think there are two, two things that comes out of that paper which are uh, very important. Uh, one is that the economic of RAM or storing data in RAM have changed significantly in the past uh, few years and he's giving actually an example for that and we used to think about the cost of gigabyte in RAM as something fairly expensive compared to disk and through the thesis uh, he shows a uh, Team Bray formula which was actually developed for Tandem where if you couple performance meaning the access time to the data, plus the capacity, then at certain th throughput, at certain uh, uh, throughput per second, yet the memory itself could be 100 times or even 1,000 times cheaper than disk, which is kind of, I think, provoking. Uh, the other thing that uh, obviously is a trend is the fact that memory becomes available at a lower cost and at bigger capacity. And there is a trend in the market uh, where we could see the same trend that follows the... Uh, uh, the trends of uh, the CPU uh, progression, uh, where the capacity doubles almost every two years, and obviously the cost goes down uh, with almost the same ratio. Uh, so that really brings us to the point where we could do things today in memory that we couldn't do in the past. And that, I think, is the main uh, point in the article. So uh, what is it we can do now in memory that we couldn't do in the past? We could use memory as an alternative to disk, essentially. We can use it as a, as a system of record. We can store data. We can transact to it. Uh, we could use it as our database. And we can rely on the reliability of, of memory. And we can make memory reliable even better than disk. And talking about this domain of architecture, I've seen the expression RAM is the new disk and disk is the new tape. What, what, do, what do they mean by that? Uh, it means that uh, what happened is that uh, in the food chain of data, uh, disk was the front end, meaning that it would store the operational data, as it is called. And then we had the data warehouses that store the archive data. Uh, today, with memory being uh, the new disk, if you'd like, or the new database, 
uh, the data moves one step backwards. So we take more of the role of the data warehouse of today, and the data warehouse of today becomes more of the tape of yesterday and things like that. So we just shift everything backward a little bit, and the database goes with that shift a little bit backward. Okay. Is this uh, paper and yourself and other people in this area saying that the software stack we're used to where you have web server, app server, and a database which is writing out to disk, that now there are alternative architectures that do not ultimately write everything out to disk. Yes, and, and there are two faults to that, or I would say several faults to that. One is because we can store data in memory, which is essentially where our application lives, there is no really need to go through those tiers where you know the data is separate from the application and therefore we have all the uh, complexity of managing the communication between the application and the life cycle and, and the consistency and availability and all the type of things that we used to. And obviously you pay the cost of latency and throughput. Uh, if the data lives where the application lives, then we can leverage that and re-architect the application or, re or design our application to actually take advantage of that. And by that I mean that we can actually run the application the data at the same place. And that I think is an idea that could be only applicable when data comes back or comes into memory. You've uh, written about something that you call the end of tier-based computing. Is that what you're, you're getting yes, at here? So exactly. what do you mean by that? So we used to think about application as a set of tiers. We have a front-end web application, we have a business logic tier, and we have a database tier. Logically, that's fine. That's usually the component of the application that we're uh, using, and this is, in most cases, the layers of the application that we need to build to deliver an application. Uh, but from a deployment perspective, that's not necessarily the best use of the resources that we have. Because it, 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 and, and usually I give a factory kind of a example to illustrate the idea, is that imagine that you build, uh, let's say, a bottle factory, where one factory does the creating the bottles, the other one is filling them, and the other one is shipping them. Now, if the entire pipelines of those three factories have different managers, and at some point they, let's say, manage uh, to produce 1,000 bottles a day, the process of scaling that pipeline is going to be fairly complex because in order to scale from 1,000 bottles a day to 10,000 bottles a day, you need to talk to each of the factories individually ask them what that means. One will say six months, one will say I'm already ready. The other one will say, well, I need to rebuild the entire uh, pipeline. And guess how long it's gonna take to actually scale in that process. You're gonna be as strong as the weakest link. So there's a lot of chattiness that you need to go through to actually scale. And obviously that in itself uh, kind of breaks the whole idea of scaling on demand because you never be able to scale on demand because you need that consensus between all those layers to really get to that scaling. It also adds a lot of complexity because all those layers needs to know about each other and it's to somehow dance in the same way, which is almost impossible. They will never dance in the same rhythm, in the same level, and they will be always be siloed from one another and therefore you, Mr. Customer, you, Mr. Application Developer, or you as a, as a manager of those pipelines, will need to take care of how those different silos work together and orchestrate together. And, and, and that realization came from, basically, if you, if you really look at how you optimize application, there is one way to optimize it, which is going in each tier, making the messaging, you know, pass messages from one place to another in the best way possible, and there is a way to optimize the database to take uh, thousands of transactions a second or even millions of transactions a second and there is a way to make the web application scalable. Even if you do all that, what I found is that when you build the application you see only small, uh, small gain compared to the individual gain that you get in each tier. And again, the reason why is because of all that chattiness. Because there are separate tiers, you need some sort of a mechanism that will make them consistent, like the through transaction. And, 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 and that goes on, and, and at, at the end of the day, it's not the right way to build the transaction pipeline of your application. Here you're talking about something called Amdahl's Law. Is right. that right? Could you explain what that is? So Amdahl's Law is, is really the, uh, a law that basically uh, um, defines the, uh, the ability to scale linearly. And, and what happens when we have contention and how contention affects scaling. Uh, 
And basically, uh, to put it in simple words, it says that the impact of contention is far bigger than the, the actual percentage of that contention. So if we have 10%, uh, let's say, contention, meaning that 10% of the time we're spending on a shared lock, for example, of a total transaction, to get it the gain of, let's say, 10 times of where we are today, we'll need 100 times of the machine to get to that gain. So we basically increase the number of machines by a factor of 90 that are just wasted just because we have 10% contention. And, and it also says that we're always going to have a limit. Uh, we're going to hit a wall beyond that 100. So if we want to scale beyond, uh, beyond a factor of 10, we're not going to be able to do that even if we had 1,000 machines. We're not going to be able to see any gain. And, and that's basically Andel slow. So there's some kind of a fundamental limit of the benefits to scaling by adding more servers. Right. And, and again, the point is the contention. And when I mentioned tier-based, tier-based has an inherent contention, which is the synchronization between the tiers. And the more you have more synchronization, the more you have contention. So, for example, one of the things that makes tier-based consistent is the shooter transaction. The shooter transaction is a very huge contention on the application itself because basically that means that uh, that would be the granularity of scaling of the application and it's going to spend a lot of time every tier in the application is going to spend a lot of time waiting for that transaction waiting for that lock to be freed what alternative is there to that model the alternative as i mentioned earlier is that when when we start to put data in memory data start to live in our application and so basically we can uh, host or collocate the data and the application together and build the application rather than a set of separate factories with separate managers as uh, independent factories that can deal with the entire pipeline independently of one another, which is called the share nothing kind of model. In this case, the way we scale is just by adding more of those units. And those units would be uh, basically handling all the transaction of the user, all the transaction of our application end to end, and will be self-sufficient. So if one node or if one of that unit of scale can deal with 1,000 operations per second, adding two nodes will be 2,000 operations per second, and, and 10 nodes would be uh, basically 10,000 operations per second. And in that case, we can scale linearly because they don't really share anything between themselves, and they don't have any point of contention. That's the ideal world. How much memory are we talking about on a node in this? That's actually a very uh, interesting topic today because there is a whole thread actually running in the past few days uh, called Big Memory. Uh, which is actually run by one of our competitors, but it's an interesting uh, thread, and I think they have an interesting argument about that. Uh, today, uh, the capacity that you could have from a hardware perspective is in uh, uh, hundreds of gigs are available already on, I wouldn't say commodity like, uh, I would say, uh, uh, low-end uh, Dell or laptop, but commodity meaning uh, significantly lower than any of the uh, high-end machines that we used to have, like mainframe or E10K from Sun or the Spark machines, uh, which basically makes it available for a large set of applications that we have today. And basically, uh, we can talk about terabytes of data in memory easily. When you're architecting this type of application on an array of these high-memory nodes, are you putting all of the data, a copy of all of the data in each node, or are you partitioning the data? Obviously, if you put all the data in all, in all the nodes, then you're going to hit, one, the capacity limit. You're not really going to uh, leverage the fact that you know, each node can contribute to the capacity. Uh, you're basically going to be uh, limited to the lowest capacity of one of the nodes in the cluster. That's going to be the maximum capacity. So that's not necessarily the recommended way and not the popular way on how you distribute data or how you manage data. Uh, what you want is to really uh, have the aggregated amount of, of capacity of each individual node, and for that you need to partition the data. And partitioning the data basically means that each node will include portion of the data of the entire data, and you can scale just by adding more of those nodes, and that's going to be the total uh, capacity that you have. Very similar to how you manage storage today. So does this approach then rely on some kind of routing for the request? Right. Uh, like in uh, DISC, where we're talking about RAID 5 and some other algorithms, uh, in this case, we're talking about hashing model or consistent hashing in some cases, uh, where basically we're saying that uh, data needs to be at each point in time in one partition. But where that partition physically lives can change. Uh, 
and there's going to be uh, uh, basically a routing mechanism that when we access the data, that routing would be able to route the request to the appropriate node that holds that data. And there was an algorithm routing, which is basically called the hash modulo. And there are more complex mapping layer where you're basically going to a mapping service and that mapping service can run that algorithm and find that node for you. Uh, we use usually the algorithmic uh, uh, mapping, which is basically computing the hash code and basically going based on that hash code into the right node. So does this rely on that the application data can be partitioned in such a way that any particular request is always going to deal with data which can be located on one node? And that you're not going to have a request come in that needs data from nodes 1, 7, and 18? Yes, yeah, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, the yes part means that if you can partition the data and route the request to each partition, then you're in the area where you're linearly scalable and you're completely independent of one another. And this is where you would hope and would design your application as much as you can to get to that point. In reality, uh, there is always uh, an area in the application in which uh, you'd need to see the entire set of data or work on the entire set. Uh, algorithm like Max calculating the max, calculating the average, all those type of things are aggregated function that requires to see the entire universe to actually produce the right data. And, and that's pretty much the, uh, the, uh, uh, the area where you'd need things like MapReduce or algorithm like that that would be able to give you an access to the entire set of data and, and produce uh, the result to you. The difference between traditional databases, for example, that handle that is that before that, uh, we kind of went to the least common denominator. Uh, and the least common denominators, all the data need to see it just for those cases in one single node. In, in this type of situation where you are possibly pulling data in from multiple nodes, do you not in the end run into the same type of problems that the CAP theorem has identified with a distributed data store? Uh, not necessarily because uh, th there are several ways to deal with that. Uh, one way, if you start to replicate data in an asynchronous fashion, then the answer is yes. You could run into consistency issues, and the consistency basically means that uh, two replicas could have uh, different versions of that same data. Uh, so let's say that I have uh, an update on customer one, and that's been propagated asynchronously to, to a node, uh, and I basically hit the older node, I'll get the older version of the data. So with consistent or with uh, uh, the way you deal with consistency is by trying to read the two copies of the data, for example, and basically at the client side resolve that conflict by, for example, returning only the latest version of that data. Uh, in our case, we make life simpler because we're basically saying in memory, we don't really uh, uh, need to do that. We can actually synchronize the data synchronously and therefore we don't have different copies of the data in two nodes. We have the same copy of the data all the time because you're going to be blocked until it's going to the, to the other node. The reason why we can do that is, again, be in memory, going synchronously is still fairly uh, efficient compared to going to disk or things like that, so we don't need to optimize it up to the level where we make that synchronization asynchronous and get it to all the, conf to all the complexity of having the data inconsistent. You're still going to hit Amdahl's law, but because the latency of memory is so much lower, it gives you a lot more headroom. Exactly. And you could be on, I would say, on the strict side of consistency and still leverage the, uh, the under laws, you rightly so said. So the cost of being more strict has gone down. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's going to be a fixed overhead versus a contention that everyone is going to hit and therefore it's not going to be fixed. It's going to be proportional to the size of the cluster. So the idea is that it's going to be fixed and not proportional to the size of the cluster. Follow up on that, could you compare the, uh, the a degree of concurrency supported by the data grid architectures compared to disk architectures? Well, inherently, uh, memory by itself is much more concurrent because we're dealing with a media that is concurrent by nature. It's, uh, it's uh, basically an array of data, and you could access any point in the array at any point of time directly by pointing to another space. Uh, versus disk, which is uh, a basically a serialized media um, uh, that needs, you know, you have a needle that needs to go to the address space that you're pointing. So depending on how many people are trying to, or how many concurrent uh, uh, applications are trying to move that needle at the same time, that's going to be the level of concurrency. And the way it's being solved, I would say, uh, 
uh, to a degree in disk is that you have a lot of those disks in one kind of box and a lot of those needles, but still you're going to be limited compared to memory, which is almost unlimited. So it comes down to the physics of the right. data store. Uh, exactly, yeah. Okay. How would a uh, memory-based architecture provide the degree of uh, transactional consistency that you get with disk-based? Well, so in the same way in disk, the only difference is the, the in, in two folds. Uh, in disk, with the way we maintain the consistency or the reliability, I would say, not necessarily the consistency, is because we store it in a media that doesn't go away, right? And, and it's stored in a disk is like it's in a safe heaven and we're safe even if the system shut down. The truth, though, is not uh, is very different. One, even if we store in disk, the disk itself could go away. And even in disk, we maintain replicas of that disk to ensure that it's going to be there. Uh, so in memory, we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, when we think about persistency, we don't necessarily need to think about persistency in a disk. We can think about persistency, meaning that the data itself needs to live somewhere else. And as long as it's somewhere else over the network, then it means that it's durable. It means that it's persistent. It means that it didn't really go away, even if my specific node that holds the data right now go away. And so we need to, th to change the way we, uh, we think about persistency and durability of the data. Uh, in, in, in this world, the definition of durability means that data is durable as long as there is at least one copy of the data somewhere else in the network. That applies also to disk, and it applies to memory. Memory, it's even more important because there is no other way. So it sounds like some of the techniques they use in Dynamo of ensuring that there's a minimum number of copies of any particular data within a cluster. Right. And, and there are caveats there as well, because obviously if you have uh, too many copies, then the overhead that you have per amount of data is going to be significant, right? If you have two copies, that means that you need to double the amount of storage that you have, or in our case, memory that you have to store that redundant data. Uh, if you have three copies, like in Dynamo, for example, then you have uh, uh, tripled the amount of or doubled the amount of overhead compared to the actual data that you're holding. Uh, so the trade-off, the way we dealt with that trade-off, for example, in Gigaspaces is that we can still live with a, with a single copy of a backup and provision one on demand when we see that one of them fails. So the window of failures could be very, very short, and therefore you could still have almost the same reliability of three or ten nodes but with the overhead of two nodes. The common technique that's used in these type of architectures of using a, a write-behind file store, can you explain how that works? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole promise of memory is the performance of memory, right? So what you don't want to have is anything that associated with disk in the critical path of a transaction or a user operation or an application operation. Uh, that basically means that you don't want to write anything to disk just to maintain reliability. And from that comes the right behind. So that means that everything that written in memory in some, in some time needs to go to disk for maintenance for other things. And uh, that needs to happen asynchronously. The caveat, again, is that you don't want to lose that data. So the thing is that when it happens asynchronously, what could happen is that the, uh, the actual data would be lost once that node that produced that data went out. So usually what happens is that we maintain... A, a, a copy of the data somewhere else again in the network that will take over if one of that node fails. So even if we're doing asynchronous replication, asynchronous writes to the data, that doesn't mean that we will lose that window in case of a failure. We'll actually have someone else taking over and uh, replaying that thing once it comes or take over. So I could see how this would work with losing a single node. You have copies of the data. If you have a power failure, you bring your disks back up and they still have whatever you last wrote to them. If you have a power failure of your uh, servers and they all shut down, they lose everything that's in memory. So how do you handle that failure case? Right. So let's talk about that failure case because really what happens in the real world, especially if you're talking about fault failover, is that you switch to a disaster recovery site. Mm. Uh, that disaster recovery site takes over and basically handles the transaction from that point. Once it does that, all the data that you have stored on disk on the other side, on the failed side, become irrelevant. And actually, it's wrong to even try to boot up with that data because that's going to be an old data and could create potential inconsistency when you bring that up. And, and that's really, uh, I think, even emphasize the point that I mentioned is that storing data in disk doesn't make your application more reliable. It actually can create just more problems. 
reliability happens by the amount of uh, copies that you have for that same data, not because you store it in a certain disk. So to go back uh, to where you were a moment ago on the example, plan for failure, you don't avoid failure. You've written an article called Why Databases Are So Breakable. And what was the, the main point you were trying to get across there? The, the main point is that people think, again, think about databases, storage, sound as the safe haven. Uh, they don't think about reliability when they put in a database. They just say, we kind of delegate that problem to someone else. He solved it, you know, like years, and, and it's all there. And then they're very surprised to have a failure in their system, and, and uh, we've seen a lot of cases where uh, the actual application uh, crashed, and a lot of application crashed in the, in the recent years. And the reason, by the way, when we hear about the, those cases is because a lot of those services became online, so we're more visible to that than we used to in the past. It doesn't mean that in the past we didn't have those failures. Uh, so, so that really tells one thing. It tells that whatever we thought that is so reliable is probably not that reliable. And it's not always the, the problem of the application. It's just the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is such failures are going to happen no matter what. It's just a statistical issue. And if that's the case, any attempt to to prevent that by putting more rigid hardware and, and, you know, kind of things around that is doomed to failure because it tried to break that entire assumption that break uh, that failures are statistics. And and the data points that I brought in the in the articles are actually data points that was gathered in ten years of data centers that actually shows and prove that point that regardless of the quality of the disk, for example, regardless of the quality of the hardware, failures was almost the same. You use a term in some of your papers, virtualized middleware and virtualized tiers. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, it's basically stretching the idea of uh, virtual storage that I think we all used and, and knew uh, to the other layer of the, uh, of the application. So in storage... Uh, we can use a local disk uh, in our laptop, and we could use the same interface to access a, a disk that lives in the cloud or live in a sandbox or a NAT box or whatever uh, box that we'll call it, which is basically uh, built out of a lot of multiple disk, physical disk, that we're not really exposed to them. We're exposed to that as one big disk. And that's really the concept of virtualization. And we can apply that to all the other layers in the tier in just the same way. So we could think about virtual queue. Virtual queue is, again, is a, is a queue that is built from a lot of different instances of physical queues that look as one. And we could think about the database in the same way. A virtual database would be a, a database that will be built out of a lot of small instances of uh, physical databases that look as one to the application that is using that, and so forth. And that's really the virtual middleware. It does the same thing that storage uh, does for disk into the other layer of the tiers. So of the application, pro sorry. Does this then mean a programmer who's used to a certain programming model, certain APIs that they can code against their familiar environment, and then at deployment time you map it onto a single node with a lot of memory? Right. Uh, so the, the nice thing about, again, if you think about uh, storage virtualization, again, the application that runs against that uh, storage, whether it's in your local laptop or in the uh, sun, looks the same. It doesn't really change because you scaled your disk into a network or virtual cloud or virtual disk. And uh, the idea is that you could do the same thing for messaging or for data. You, you can write to a local database or to a local uh, uh, messaging queue and then say, I want to scale, and the same code would work also with that, uh, with that type of scalable environment. Uh, there are obviously more complexity in that, in that switch because in many cases you do need to have an awareness in the application that this is going to happen because of the things that I mentioned earlier, because on how you optimize it is not just by letting the data fly anywhere, but you, kn you need to know where the data is going and you want to optimize that. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of chattiness in the network and things like that. So up to that point, I would say, it makes your life much simpler. In reality, you do need to be aware and design the application with awareness of that distribution. So then the design becomes not so much a matter of how do you design out each tier because all the tiers are running on the same node, but how do you design the data so that it's near the processing? Right. That's the most, uh, I would say, important decision in any application architecture in the desired environment is how you partition the data.
So could you give us an example of an application and uh, how you that you've that you've worked on and how you partition the data? Right, and and the the couple of examples. I'll start with uh, let's say uh, trading. Uh, you could think about trading like you have uh, feeds, which is basically a lot of streams of of uh, 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 market data, and then you have uh, a trade, which is basically certain transaction that belongs to a certain user that manage a certain portfolio. So you have this hierarchy of data model where feed is at the lower level and you have transaction a little bit higher and you have portfolio which is even higher than that. And you can decide uh, where you put the, uh, uh, the actual granularity of your partitioning. So if, for example, I go with market data, that means that I'll be very fine grain, which, which gives me a lot of room for scaling and flexibility in the application. Uh, the problem, though, is that a lot of the queries that I'm going to hit, let's say, are probably going to look for a trade. Are going to need a, an ordering between one feed and the other, right? Because I don't want to have a buy before uh, a sell, and uh, sorry, a buy before a bid, and, and things like that. And I want to maintain ordering. If I'll start to spread that at the uh, the lower market data level, I'm going to lose that uh, uh, that ordering as well. So in that case, it would make sense to partition based on the uh, a little bit higher level, not just the feed, but transaction because of the ordering. So that's one factor. The other factor is the query. How do I access the data and what would be the most frequent way to access the data? If the most frequent way to access the data would be based on the portfolio, then it probably makes sense to partition based on the portfolio in order that, as, as we said earlier, when we talk about Underlaw, we want to build systems that will be in a share nothing kind of model. So when all those queries to be optimized so that they will run in a, in a single node rather than in a in should node and rather than uh, be spread across the node and we'll have all those network chattiness. So that's kind of, I would say, the trade-offs. Obviously, if we do go to portfolio, we're limited in the level of scaling because the granularity of scaling is going to be that portfolio. And if we don't have enough of those portfolios, we could run into a situation where a single portfolio is going to be blocked on a scalability problem because it's going to be locked to a certain node and it's not going to be able to scale beyond that node. And so that's kind of the trade-offs and there is no generic solution for that. And it's uh, all of a sudden requires... Uh, an understanding of how we access the data across the application, and it requires a lot of knowledge of things that we are not really uh, know that much when we design the application and move it from a, a central model to a distributed model. What if the database guy says to you, Nadi, I have my nice flat relational database and all my tables are uh, have foreign keys to each other. I can start from any point in the model and go to any other point, whereas you have to make some assumptions about what queries you're going to do, and if that changes, it breaks your architecture. Well, the same thing applies to databases because, uh, you know, one of the main contention that I'm seeing is people doing select for update. And select for update in many of the databases is, uh, is, uh, is a huge contention point. So that basically means that a lot of the users are going to wait on other users. And basically that means that they're not going to really utilize the hardware nor the disk of their application, and they're not going to be able to scale. And, and we're seeing it a lot in e-commerce these days. Uh, people build the application that way, they're being locked, and they have to think about distributed uh, architecture. The other driver for that is cost. Uh, we have several customers that uh, build the application on very high-end E10K uh, Sun machines, and, uh, and, and that's the only way they could scale is by scaling up. And in that case, what happened is that their competitors came into the market, new competitors, and came up with a scale-out model, which was... 10 times lower in terms of cost and much more scalable, much more efficient. S and they, so, so they got themselves to a point where they couldn't really compete. And to compete, they have to invest millions of dollars and years just to be able to preserve the, the, the position in the market. And, the, and in, during that time, they actually lost a lot of their uh, uh, customers uh, to those newcomers. Uh, so, so I would say that by uh, going distributed, you're probably going to be able to go to a central model in any time, but, but the other way around is not really possible. You can't really go centralized and then go distributed. And therefore, I would recommend that you whatever end results or, or the deployment that you'll choose, you'll design your application so that it could be distributed. Do you use the term scale up versus scale out? What do you mean by that? Uh, scale-up normally means that we have uh, a, s a single machine and we can add 
more resources to that machine and scale more resources meaning cores memory etc and and uh, usually the practice of scaling up is is mostly uh, doing multi-threaded kind of uh, programming and parallel programming within a single application within a single process scanning out is almost the same thing but across the network a network of machines now there is a huge difference between the two in terms of complexity even though conceptually again they are the same uh, the difference really starts from the point where we don't really share the same address space it's no longer an application that runs in a single process it's an application that scale out it's an application that runs in a network and that adds a lot of complexity because now we can have partial failures uh, things could you know network could break uh, the application could break all the things that within a single process doesn't really exist in terms of the challenges that we need to deal with uh, the other challenge which is common to both of them is how do you write code that will be efficiently uh, utilizing the actual resources in that and that's where parallelization comes into place and there are different level of uh, the way you could do parallelization within in process kind of programming versus parallelization across the network and in many cases the mechanism would be slightly d- different even though the pattern would be the same uh, so what i'm seeing today and that's why it became a very popular topic today is We got to the point, especially with cloud, that scaling out became almost a de facto way in which you design application. And all of a sudden, in the past year, uh, Intel came up with those big machines where people said, well, actually, we don't necessarily need to scale out because we have commodity hardware that can deal with most of the workload in a single box. And so, so maybe we can revert back and, and think about you know, just scaling up and, and forget about the complexity associated with that. And, and, and that brought me to write that piece, which basically kind of hints or talks about the points in which you would, even if uh, an application would fit within a single node, you would still need to think about scaling out. It sounds like scaling out is pretty hard because it brings up all these failure cases. Right. Well, why would you want to scale out if you had the choice of scaling up? And that's really the, the great question. One of them is uh, the redundancy, meaning that uh, by having one application that lives in one box, If it's, it's going to fail, our entire application fails. And as Amazon, uh, uh, I think, uh, rightly said in a lot of their papers, uh, Werner Vergel, I think, uh, was quoted in a lot of them, and, but also others in the, in the application itself, the way you deal with failures is not by preventing them, uh, but coping with them. And, and, uh, and by having everything within a single application basically goes against that. Uh, the other reason is uh, the fact that uh, y- there is a demand for distribution because let's say that the application itself or the user of the application lives in different places and therefore you want to manage latency by putting pieces of the application in different places closer to where the users are going to access that. So there are, there are cases in which distribution is part of the nature of the application. Could there be another reason that would have to do with highly variable loads? Right. Right. So the, uh, the, uh, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, the, the other thing is the flexibility. Uh, flexibility could be that uh, even if I have one machine and it can meet my capacity, I could never, or I wouldn't say never, but at least it would be very hard to predict what's going to be the, 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 the type of load that I'm going to expect in my application in a year or two years from now. And if I'm very successful, I probably want to be able to grow by a factor of 10. And I'm not going to be assured that there's going to be a machine at that capacity available at that time that's going to be uh, that could provide me that level of scaling so scale out gives me the flexibility to choose or to grow when I need to and uh, not be limited to the resources that I'm having there is also the economic of scale which gives me also more room to play with in terms of how I actually build my application in terms of the actual resources uh, that I'm not going to be bounded to the a certain high expensive resource how can people how can programmers query these systems do, do they provide a SQL type layer that makes the entire thing look like a single database uh, so again the answer is depending on the implementation at least now uh, so conceptually um, basically a lot of those systems are bas- based on what is called key value store mm-hmm. and that's kind of the underlying store which is basically a big hash table And that big hash table includes a very simple query mechanism. 
uh, which basically requires that you write a lot of code to actually access the data or manipulate it. Uh, there is another way which is called MapReduce, uh, which basically means that you can uh, spawn code like in store procedures, uh, but in more dynamic fashion into the node that holds the data. And basically you use code to access the data and do more sophisticated stuff. Uh, that in itself requires also a lot of writing skills and a developer skills to manipulate the data, which is not always the most convenient way to manipulate and manage data. And, and, and therefore, uh, in that regard, what I would say is that this is where SQL is actually good. SQL is a dynamic language that was designed for more than 20 years for managing and manipulating data. And there are several parts in SQL which are, uh, I would say, a good thing, like joins and other things that could kill an application very easily. But there is a lot of other things that are fairly simple and good. And, and we could actually utilize a lot of that semantics to... Um, access data whether it's in a key, uh, wet, whether the underlying mechanism is key value store, or whether the underlying mechanism is tables or whatever. So, are you familiar with some tools like Pig or Hive, which provide a SQL-like layer on top of the Hadoop MapReduce? And this is a very good example, and the answer is yes. And 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 this shows exactly the trend that I just mentioned. Uh, Hadoop started with the key value store, and basically HDFS, which is even simpler, which is a file system then HBase is the key value database to, uh, on top of that. And then people wrote a lot of Java code to manipulate data and find themselves, even for the simple operation, writing a lot of code. And that made things much, uh, much more complex. Uh, Hive and Pig basically provide the high-level abstraction that basically provide you an SQL-like semantics. And uh, then that SQL semantics is being interpreted into that underlying Java code uh, that people are using. And in that case, you could express even a complex query in a much simpler way using that abstraction. And that's where Pig and Hive comes into place. And this is where I'm saying that queries, SQL queries, or SQL semantic doesn't really contradict with scale. It's the way we implement them rather than the language itself or the query language itself. Many of the large websites are using hundreds or thousands of memcache servers. And if you look at how much memory they have, they have most or all their data in memory anyway. So are, are they really just doing the same thing you're talking about? Uh, similar things. The, the main difference between what they do and what I just described is the uh, memcache itself is not, uh, at least right now, uh, a transactional system. Uh, so essentially what they're using it is to access data and not necessarily transact on it. And, and uh, that's really a big difference. So that basically means that the pattern that they use it is that every query goes still to a database, and only then you could start and utilize the memory. So they really be thinking about re-architecting into more of a memory-based approach like you're talking about? Right. And I think once they have the data in memory, they, they could get more out of that memory and use it uh, not just for read kind of uh, processes. They can also use it for read-write processes or transaction. Okay. So you've given a talk at a number of conferences called S Building a Scalable Twitter. Everybody knows what Twitter is, but it's deceptively difficult to scale. Why is that? Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, actually, because I think Twitter does stretches almost every dimension of scaling possible. And, and it's also interesting from the uh, part that most people would come to the challenge of scaling Twitter from a different paradigm. So there are people who are coming from a messaging paradigm who would think of Twitter as a messaging system. And there are people who are coming from a database paradigm that will think of Twitter as a, just a, da a database. And, and, and you'll see different approaches on how people uh, use that. So I found that it's a very good exercise to explain the suit computing and scalability patterns uh, based on the Twitter challenge that everyone knows. And the reason why Twitter is, is, uh, is fairly uh, complex in, in scaling is because the dimension of scaling are, one, the number of users that are continuously added into the system, the traffic that each user generates, but even more, the connection that each user have, the association that user have with followers, and the type of operation he can actually do in a repetitive way on those followers. So that means that every user is growing in terms of the traffic that is going to generate and contribute to the system continuously. So it's a system that continuously grows all the time, and each user contributes to that system, so it's kind of have, a, if you like, a positive uh, loopback. Uh, 
where it continuously grows and grows and grows, and therefore the scaling of this, this type of system is going to be very, very complex. And how do you design those type of systems? And n never, I think, before Twitter, uh, a system will build for those type of challenges. And that's why I thought that it's a very interesting challenge. So from having read your paper on this, what I saw as being at the core of it really was this many-to-many -many problem with readers and writers. Do yes. you agree? Yes. Uh, that's, that's really the, uh, I mean, most systems today were either point-to-point, -point, transactional system, or one-to-many, which is kind of a broadcast system. But not necessarily many to many, which is the uh, uh, became the uh, the common use case in in Twitter. There is almost no point to point, or the point to point is actually the lower uh, end of that spectrum. And and uh, and again, today we didn't really dealt with that uh, scalability problem, and Twitter really uh, uh, provide a very good scenario why you would need that level of scaling. Do you give some examples of approaches that might not work? Why why shouldn't I? build a database application and have a many-to-many -many relationship between two tables and, or table to itself? Because what, what would happen is that you'll find that uh, you're going to continuously hit the database. and So so that there's one challenge, which is the real timeliness, right? You want to be able to get the data in a, fresh, in, a, in a fairly fast fashion and assuming that you're going to access it from a mobile phone or from a desktop or from any, anywhere. You want to be able to access it in a very uh, efficient fashion. So obviously, if you're going to hit those queries and you're going to map every request to the database through queries, you're going to get to the same scalability problem where the database is going to be a central point of contention and you're not going to be able to support that amount of users and that amount of queries. And database is not going to serve you for that. So it's going to serve a small amount of users but not a lot of users. What about if we uh, add some memcache in front of it? Does that help us? That That's going to help quite a bit. Uh, and... Again, to a degree, it could almost solve the problem, but again, to a degree. Uh, the reason why is because uh, that we can split the application into two segments. One of them, the after we logged into the system and we're continuously monitoring the followers and the people we follow and basically polling for the, the actual data that we, we need, and that's going to hit the, uh, the memory and not the disk or not the database. And the point in which we log in first to the system, in which we want the historical uh, update of the, the, the entire, I would say, users that we're following. In that case, we're, it's okay for us to wait a little bit longer until that uh, state uh, is synchronized into our desktop and we can actually start from there polling continuously. Uh, so the, the idea that I mentioned is that one way to solve that problem in a much simpler way is to split the application in those two dimensions based on time. One holds the uh, uh, the current window of time where we can store, let's say, the last 30 minutes, and the other one stores the historical data, uh, in which we can uh, only, ne which we only need uh, only when we log into the system and when there was, was a network failure or something like that. So we rarely going to hit the actual historical data in that model. How about building it on top of a published subscribe messaging system? That uh, that's work? that's uh, that's uh, that's the funny part of that is that most people that I ask, especially those that comes from messaging paradigm, would start with that as a model. Uh, the thing though, immediately once you start, and I even when I thought about that as a challenge, I, I thought about it in those terms as well because I'm coming from an event-driven uh, paradigm uh, kind of uh, background. And 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 if you think about it, what will happen is that each user would need to maintain his own queue. Each user would mean to maintain his own durable queue because you want to make sure that, you know, if I log in and I, you know, log out, all the updates that I'm supposed to see are going to stay there. Now, multiply that queues into the amount of users and the amount of data that each user is going to accumulate, and you're going to hit a huge amount of data very quickly. So you don't want to, you don't want to get to the point in Twitter because it generates that amount of traffic and data where you start to accumulate data per user. You're going to be able to have one copy of the data and just have multiple users referencing the data rather than accumulating that. And how how would you now that I've asked you all the things that didn't work? How would you solve this problem with a uh, in-memory data grid? Yeah, so I kind of hinted already in the in the solution where we break the system into two parts: the historical parts and the uh, and the real-time part. The real-time part would be managed by the in-memory data grids. Uh, which, unlike Memcache, could handle 
uh, more complex queries and you could actually do more on the memory side than you would normally in memcache. Uh, you could express uh, queries like uh, finding all the data from all your followers or all the people that you follow using a MapReduce and DataGrid does support that. And, and the in-memory data grid would basically just be a, a better version of Mapcache, where it could do, you know, like in Mapcache, you could do key uh, queries, key value queries. And in data grid, you could do MapReduce, or you could do uh, more sophisticated queries. And you would need that to do, for example, a query of give me all the updates in the last uh, 10 seconds or the last uh, second of all your followers or give me all the tweets of all the users that uh, looked for gigaspaces. So you need that type of things if you want to do that in memory and do that continuously and you want to be able that the, you want to be at the point where the memory could serve those requests and you don't want to get f just for those requests to go to the disk. How do you partition the data among the nodes if it's more than you can fit in one node? So there are two parts of that. One, this is a classic problem that the problem itself is not uh, easily partitioned. Uh, you can't really break, you can either break it by user, but then you can't really make sure that a certain users and follower would sit in the same partition. So by definition, it's not really going to be solved. Uh, this is a classic case where uh, you can't really partition to the point where it's going to be a share nothing model. Uh, the second piece in terms of the split is that you're usually going to have a short window in time in which most users are going to access the system. So, for example, if I'm using uh, um, one of my client, TweetDeck or whatever, uh, that polls every, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 10 seconds or uh, 30 seconds uh, the system, then I need to have that at least one minute of window available in that buffer, if you like. In some cases, I would say five minutes, just to make sure that subsequent requests would still hit the memory and wouldn't go to disk. And I wouldn't lose anything there. So if I could just interrupt, then how much data are we talking about keeping five minutes of tweets in memory? So I measure that by taking the limits. And, and Twitter, uh, one of the way that Twitter managed scalability is that it put limits on the system so that you wouldn't really be able to uh, uh, hit the system and kill it uh, completely. And if you do the math, uh, I think it was uh, 70 messages a second by users, and we're talking about 128 bytes or something like that, if I remember correctly, of message uh, size of message per user. Uh, you could accumulate a buffer of 30 minutes within 5 gigs of data only. Uh, so it's going to be almost as simple to do that in a single node even. Yeah, I've got more than that on my laptop. Exactly, yeah. And, 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 and you could serve millions of users uh, continuously querying that system in that model. Uh, obviously, uh, you may have more traffic and you may have more users, but but you could see that you could very easily solve that problem if you're following that type of model. Uh, the point I think that still remains complex is how do you minimize the uh, the number of users hitting all the cluster, and 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 there is more sophisticated ways to avoid that, and and I wouldn't get right now into that because I don't know how to describe it, you know, without writing on board or something like that. So in this model, where does the association between user and followers or user and people they're following, where does that association live? It lives in the query. Uh, so basically when I do a query, I basically say, give me, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to my user and then I'm saying, give me all the followers. And then I'm doing a query with the key of each of the followers and say, give me all the tweets from those followers in the last 10 seconds. So basically, uh, each tweet needs to have a, a key of a timestamp, and it needs to be indexed based on time, and uh, when and it needs to be indexed based on the ID of the followers. So when I do that query, I do that query based on those two indexes, the follower or the user and the timestamp. And I'm looking at each of the users and basically getting all the tweets in the last 10 seconds of that user. Social networks, the social graph is one of the most important data structures, and that does not fit at all well into a relational database. Is, is that one of the factors that's causing those systems to strain? Yes, and uh, as, as I said earlier, it's, it's a complex problem that is not even easily solvable within a partition data store. Uh, and, and this is where usually MapReduce or things like that comes into place. Uh, but yes, definitely social graphs and the ability. And, and when I gave the uh, the example in Twitter, this is 
classic or I would say even a simpler version of a social graph. LinkedIn would have a much more complex uh, graph there if you if you think about it. And and because of all those type of things, you have to think differently in how you structure the data and how you manage it. And and obviously, letting the database deal with that uh, is not going to work. What are the the economic drivers that are making these RAM based architectures more uh, realistic now? Uh, so if you look at the trends today in the market, uh, there are two categories of trend. One of them is business trends, or I would say user trends, and the other one is technical trends. I'll start with the technical cre- trends, which are easy. Uh, we're at the point where today we have multi-core, uh, 26, and even more cores on a relatively commodity hardware. Uh, the memory, the, the network itself grew from uh, 100 megabytes to 1 gigs, and now we're approaching 10 gigs. Uh, we already have 10 gigs, and we're approaching 100 gigs. So we're speeding up on that in an ex- almost exponential manner. And uh, the same goes with memory. We started with a few gigs, and now we have three to 350 gigs, and we have half a tera already available and one tera coming up. Uh, so all of the resources are advancing at a very high speed, in terms of the resources that are available on a commodity kind of uh, hardware. Uh, most of the application, however, that was designed today were not really built for that type of environment. So if I'm an IT shop uh, and I want to maximize the utilization to get the most out of those resources, and on the other hand, all my application were not really designed for those applications, by definition, I'm not going to be able to utilize them. And the only way people utilize them today is by running a lot of those applications independently of one another, but that's not really the way you want to utilize the resources. You want to be able to take an exchange and make sure that it maximizes the utilization of those resources or any application that you can think of. Uh, So that's one thing that, you know, there is an economic that makes resources at a higher level of capacity available today, but we can't really utilize them unless we make that change into the application. The other uh, uh, drive is scalability tsunami, as I call it. And the scalability tsunami means that uh, if you think about software as a service, uh, where in previous years we had one application you know, installed in each customer site serving only the uh, users within that uh, uh, site, now we have it shared across all our customers, and all of a sudden all the customers are going to access the same application, which obviously uh, drives demand for scaling. There is the social networks. Uh, that obviously demand that I'm not sure that I need to go through the reason even why. And 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 beyond social networks, we're seeing in e-commerce the combination of almost the two things, uh, the behaviors of users and the traffic that we're, that is uh, uh, being generated by users is completely different than it used to be. Instead of having a fairly read-mostly kind of behavior, uh, most of the content in the website today is driven by the users themselves, which basically transform the, the traffic behavior from a read mostly to read-write kind of scenarios. And, and, and that changed a lot of the, uh, uh, I would say, mechanics and economics of how we uh, operate today and how we need to operate if we want to take advantage of the, the resources that are available today. Everything is always getting cheaper and faster, but for the balance of power to shift it, some of the ratios have to be changing because something's getting cheaper at a faster rate than something else? Or what are the key ratios within the hardware that have really shifted? Well, I think that uh, if you think <coughs> about the speed of uh, cores and speed of memory, that Moore's law actually defines the ratio that, you know, in every two years we, we double the capacity and, and memory and disk basically follow that rules. Network follows a very similar pattern as we've seen. And, and, and that's kind of the growth that is expected. Uh, everyone's thought that we've got to get to the point where uh, Murlow and all those type of things are going to break because we, we actually got to the point where it was very hard to increase the number of transistor per core, if you like, and that's where multi-core came in. And the same thing happens in, in network bandwidth. Instead of thinking about a switch as one single thing that needs to transfer a lot of bytes, they basically built a lot of those boxes in one box. And, and make them look as one as, as we talked about virtualization. So I think that that law would even accelerate, then then uh, then will slow down. Okay. There are some some interesting data you cited that show these failure rates for disks. Are there any sort of failure rates that you could cite for memory systems that would 
be a true apples to apples comparison with disk failure rates? Uh, unfortunately, not at this point, even though I saw some uh, statistics around that, because uh, there isn't, I mean, even, even for disk, I was surprised to see that the only point in time in which someone, in that case Google, uh, started to gather that data was only around 2008, 2007. Now, you would imagine disk exists for, I don't know, 20, 30 years or even more. And no one even bothered to look for that data. And right now, we're at the point where I think uh, there is not too much data uh, gathered on uh, memory failures uh, statistics. There is little of that, and I wouldn't say that that's something that I could easily point out to. And I, and I did try to find that data. Uh, so I think it's mostly a maturity thing rather than anything else. Uh, Nadi, if people would like to follow your uh, writing and your activity, how can they do that? Uh, the traditional way, uh, there is a blog, which is on type, uh, natishalom.typehead.com, uh, natishalom in one word. And uh, there is Twitter, which is also named natishalom. Uh, there is also an email, which is natishalom at gmail.com. So it's kind of consistent on that level on all, almost all medias. I don't use Facebook, so don't try that. And uh, I love Twitter, so you could always do that. Twitter is probably the most favorite way for me to communicate with people. And tell us about the company, your company, Gigaspaces. So Gigaspaces has been around for 10 years. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, the, the main problem that we're trying to solve is scaling. Uh, we started by solving the problem of scaling at the data layer, and we expanded that to work on the entire application stack, uh, which is the verb tier, the load balancer, and all those other things. And we call that uh, Zap, which is Extreme Application Platform. It's essentially an end-to-end -end application uh, solution, if you like. And uh, that's what Gigaspaces does today. If people would like to find out more about Gigaspaces, how would they do that? Uh, Gigaspaces.com is the place to go. Nadi Shalom, thank you very much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you very much, Robert. It was a pleasure. Thanks to Nick Morgan for doing the large part of the audio editing of this episode. Nick is our newest team member in the support area. This is Robert for Software Engineering Radio. The show is an all-volunteer project. If you would like to get involved, either doing interviews or with web or audio support, send us an email or visit us on the web and look for the Get Involved page. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. Software Engineering Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website, or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit delicious links and the slash dot button. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net, or if it is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podside Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle.